All right, good evening, everyone. Um, so thank you all for coming um, in this evening hour. Uh, the good news is it's rain outside, so you would rather be here with us than outside. Um, uh, so we have, uh, I'm Sergey Nitesin. I'm, uh, I'm a tutorials chair this year at Informs Conference. Uh, so uh, today we're gonna have a tutorial for you on deep learning and computer vision. Uh, co-authored by uh, Param Singh from Carnegie Mellon, so he's here in the audience. Uh, but the presenter is going to be Nikhil Malik, and Nikhil is a PhD student at Carnegie Mellon. Um, he actually spent a few years at Goldman Sachs working with those exact technologies, um, uh, probably trying to make a lot of money, right? But uh, he gave up all of that and moved to academia, to the dark side. Uh, so please uh, welcome Nikhil, and he's going to manage uh, time the way he wants. Uh, he will tell you what he's going to do with the questions, and I hope to learn something in the process. Please, Nikhil. Thanks a lot. Uh, so first of all, welcome to the session. Uh, it's 4.30 p.m. Uh, towards the evening, so I thank you for taking your time out and coming to the session. Uh, so today we are going to be talking about deep learning in computer vision. We're going to spend a lot of time first looking over, starting from very simple methods, the most basic methods to do this, and sort of build it up to more advanced methods to solve significantly complicated tasks. My own research and Professor Paramvir's research is most, more focused on implications of deep learning in markets and society. So things like interpretability, causality, fairness, and bias. So towards the end of the tutorial, we'll move from methods that are used in computer vision to sort of look at implications of these methods in markets and society. So before I uh, set the agenda for the entire talk, let's just warm up a bit, sort of look at a few examples of what kind of things we are talking about when we say computer vision. What kind of problems do we want to solve? So here's one example, very, very commonly used, I'm sure, throughout uh, this conference. Uh, the example of a self-driving robot, where the self-driving robot is essentially sort of picking out uh, pedestrians and cars and figuring out what steering control uh, to perform based on these pedestrians and the car movements. So we're going to be looking at how uh, such robots use computer vision and deep learning to sort of make these object identifications in real time. Yet another example is from the medical field where uh, we now use uh, deep learning methods to detect tumor cells on MRI images. Here's an example, interesting example of detecting ships close to a harbor. And the idea is sort of little, uh, this is just one example where you're picking out ships on the harbor, but think sort of more broadly in terms of what can be picked up from satellite images. And you can imagine that you can track uh, illegal deforestation, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, rescue operations after natural catastrophe, uh, refugee settlements, wildfire risk, micro weather forecasting. So these are all uh, applications that we are, we are starting to see emerge. And so these are, these are still areas which are open for further research. These are not solved problems. A lot needs to be done to go from a sort of simple example of demonstrating that this can be done to actually having a finalized product which can be used uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. A similar example, a very interesting paper that came out a, few, uh, a while back was, again, using satellite images to figure out the extent of poverty. And this sort of uses the images and kind of features on the, on the ground to figure out, to predict the average household expenditure and wealth. So you can imagine, so when, when, we, when we are talking about computer vision and images, uh, we are not necessarily talking about uh, sort of just detecting objects on an image. We are sort of taking it forward and sort of talking about what are the impacts that we can have on society and markets in a much larger context. Impacts that what we can learn about economy, what we can learn about uh, supply chain, the global supply chain, and what kind of impacts can we have if we have real-time information about these aspects. I guess um, on a more lighter note, we have these examples these days of deep fake images, deep fake videos. Uh, again, in this example, the top two images are the real images, the bottom two are fake images created by deep learning methods. And we are going to talk about the method that's used to create these kind of fake images. But of course, as academics, our intent is more to understand how these fake images are created sort of so, so that we can figure out adversarial methods to protect against these kind of fake material online. 
So what's really happening behind the scene in all of these examples? Very simply, what's the basic underlying problem that we are trying to solve? We have an image as an input. So we have this image which has 16 cross 12 dimension, which means 196 pixels. Each of the pixel value, uh, each of the pixels takes a value from 0 to 255, and that's our input. And in this example, we are just trying to figure out whether there is a face present or absent in the picture. So that's the most basic task that we're trying to accomplish. So Y is our label, and we take an example where Y is known to us. That's a human or by some other manner, we know that this face, this image has a face on it. But we don't know what is the mapping function going from the X input to the Y output. We don't know the mapping function, and what we want to do is find an approximate mapping function f parameterized by w that goes from x to y. So our predicted outcome y cap is essentially a function of the input x and these parameters w. And this is, very, this is something that's very common in, in any optimization problem. So we are not talking about something completely new. This is something that we have done in the past. Uh, we are just coming up slightly different variants of how we have solved these problems in the past. And the way we are going to describe how well we are doing at these tasks, it is by looking at how well we are able to mimic, how well our Y caps are able to mimic the Y labels that are known to us. And to do that, we'll essentially define some sort of a loss function between our Y caps and Ys. And we are going to try to see if we can minimize these loss functions over large number of images, over expectation over all possible images in the world. So this is the problem statement for this entire session. And essentially, we're going to look at how do we design an optimization algorithm to learn or to optimize the parameters w, and how do we select the function f. The function f is going to be essentially a deep architecture, and we are going to talk about many such deep architectures, which are our function f, which decide how the parameters w interact with the input x. And once we have defined such an architecture, we will also describe uh, a few possible optimization algorithms to figure out the optimal values of these parameters w. So let's look at why deep learning has been doing so well in the last decade. Uh, so one of the main reasons is the architecture f, the unique, uh, the, depth, the unique depth of the architecture. And what it allows us to do is to do a lot of these computations in parallel. We didn't have GPUs and TPUs more than a decade back. So we did, we did have an understanding of these kind of architectures, but we didn't really have a way to solve them quickly enough. About a decade back, we started using GPUs on these parallel architectures, and suddenly it was possible for us to go from an architecture that, that's three layer deep to 10 layers, 50 layers, and 100 layers, which meant the, that the sophistication of tasks that we could solve using these architectures just exploded. So we had a sense of uh, these architectures, but we just didn't know a sort of a good way to compute them quickly enough. And that's something that has happened in the last decade. The second interesting feature is because of the depth of uh, these networks, and we'll see some examples in a while, what they typically end up doing is sort of break down the problem, a complex problem, into simpler abstract parts. And there is not a lot of theoretical uh, reasoning why exactly that happens. There isn't you know, necessarily a proof that this will always happen, but it tends to happen. And we'll see some intuitive reasons of why we believe that in a deep network, shallow layers will sort of break down complex questions into simpler parts, and then more deeper layers will, com will, com will combine the, sh uh, the simpler parts into more complex functions. And the last part why it's, it's been performing so well is the optimization function when applied to minimize this cost function that I described tends to find a minima, a local minima, which ends up being relatively close to the global minima. Again, theoretical proofs on this are still a work in progress. Uh, for specific architectures, for specific uh, models, there are proofs on how close you can get to the global minima, but that's not true for all architectures that we will talk about today. It just seems like we are, so frankly, it seems like we are a bit lucky that just doing a simple stochastic gradient descent, just trying to find the local minima, we actually, in a lot of these cases, we end up finding uh, minimas that are fairly close to the global minima itself. 
Now that we know that deep learning does so well, uh, it's, it's not like the story is over. It's not like there's nothing else to do. So there, these are just three of the issues that I will highlight in the tutorial today. The first one is interpretability. The idea that you want to give this model that does prediction on tumor cells to a doctor, but they're not going to use it unless they can interpret the reasoning behind a prediction. Because they are the ones that are ultimately responsible to the patient. They are the ones who have to convey to the patient whether there's a tumorous cell or not. So they wouldn't be comfortable conveying this prediction to a patient unless they know the interpretation behind deep learning models prediction. So that's interpretability. The second issue is causality, where even if you're able to interpret the reason behind a deep learning models prediction, does it mean that you should use the prediction to make policy changes in the market? If you make policy changes, does a deep learning model and its predictive power, does it remain unchanged in this new environment or does it change completely? And we'll see that it's quite risky to, make, take, pol uh, to take policy decisions just based on these uh, predictions from the deep learning model. And finally, the aspect of fairness or bias, uh, where we will say that a lot of this ultimately depends on training data. Training data comes from an environment which is biased. It comes from human choices that are biased in the past. And therefore, it's likely that uh, these deep learning models will mimic these biases as well. And that's, that's, that's why we have a problem. We have to figure out a way in which uh, we have to at least be conscious of the fact that you know, just because it's a machine, it's not objective. It, it is based on human past decisions. So it's likely that it also has stereotypes and biases. And so we have to figure out how to deal with those. So that sort of sets the agenda for the rest of uh, this talk, where I will first start with a very simple uh, deep network called a fully connected deep network. Uh, then I'll come to convolutional uh, deep network, which are applied on images. Then I'll go to slightly more complicated networks, uh, attention networks, uh, networks that generate description, textual description of images, and generative deep networks that create art or new images altogether. And finally, we'll sort of change gears and talk more about impact of deep learning models in terms of their interpretability, causality, and fairness. So for most of the tutorial, I'm, I'm happy if there are questions in the middle. I'll try to keep uh, track of time myself, so if there are too many questions, I might uh, delay them for later. But please, please feel free to ha uh, sort of raise a question in the middle of the tutorial. All right. So let's start with the simplest example. On the left-hand side, you have a two-dimensional uh, space where you have a whole bunch of training samples available. Each training sample has two dimensions. Earlier we saw an example of an image which had 19, sorry, 16 cross 12 uh, pixels, which meant that it had 196 features. So this is much simpler. Every sample here just has two features. And all we want to do is figure out a model or a function that classifies the blue ones from the orange ones. Once we have this model, we want to test this model on new test data. And we sort of mo more or less expect that, that the new test data will be different from the training data, but overall it's sort of functionally is going to align on the training data. It's gonna sort of the pattern are going to remain similar. So all we need to do, we believe that if we do well on the training data, that performance of classification should remain well on the test data as well. So here's, a, here's the simplest a uh, single layer network to do this. You start from the left. Uh, I don't know if you can see the laser pointer. I'll sort of try to uh, uh, orient you even if you can't see the pointer. You start from the left, essentially for any of these, of this jth sample, a single dot, you sort of feed in its x1 and x2 features. You're, paid, you're, you're multiplying it element-wise with these parameters w. Uh, you get a uj, you apply a softmax function, you get a prediction. This is actually nothing but logistic regression. Right? And if you apply this, you get a descent boundary, a linear descent boundary in this space. You get some w1, w2 stars, which are optimized value of these parameters. Uh, if you sort of plot out the softmax function, the uh, sort of descent boundary between y is equal to one and y is equal to two, using these calculations, essentially you end up with this linear descent boundary. This obviously doesn't do the job. It's, it's not doing a good job of classifying uh, orange from blue. 
So you make it a little bit more complicated. You add, you add one more layer. So I haven't really described why am I adding these layers, but let's say we just add one more layer and hope that you know, things might just work out uh, if the model is a little bit more complex. So I add one more layer. So I have this middle layer, which is a linear combination of the inputs, and then I have a second layer, which is a linear combination of this middle layer. Unfortunately, this doesn't work out either, because uh, you imagine that the first one is a linear combination of the x, y axis. The second one is like a linear combination of some linear combinations, which is also a linear combination. And therefore, you still end up with a linear boundary in this uh, space. And a linear boundary is just not going to do, a, do the job uh, in this example. And this is where we sort of uh, bring in the first concept of nonlinear activations. To be able to model nonlinear complicated functions, we might use depth of the networks, but we also need some nonlinear transformations. So what we are going to do is essentially apply some sort of nonlinearity on top of these neurons. And the simplest nonlinearity that we are applying is something called the ReLU or Rectified Linear Unit, which essentially is convert, essentially sort of uh, saying that if the input going into U01 is positive, then let it be. If it's negative, make it zero. As simple as that. These, this, this is how some of the linear, some of the nonlinear activations look like. So, ReLU is the one that we are using, but there are a few other ways to sort of uh, apply nonlinear transformation on these neurons. Uh, and you can see this example where sort of the uh, input has certain values, which is uh, minus 0.4 plus minus 0.94x1 plus 0.87x2, and after applying the ReLU transformation, it's a max of zero and that entire weighted sum of the inputs. And th great, we, we solved the problem. Uh, just by applying this nonlinear activation, we were able to allow the network to create or learn a nonlinear combination of the inputs, and we got these nonlinear boundaries to be able to classify the blues from the reds. Let's sort of look at uh, this example in a little bit uh, more detail, uh, just to get a sense of what's happening. So this is a very nice uh, playground that you might uh, use a little later to get an understanding of this. Uh, what's happening behind the scenes. So let's take a very simple example. This is an even simpler example than what I showed you. And what's happening here is again, there are some inputs x1, x2, and we just have a single layer, uh, like a logistic regression. And you run this, and you get this boundary right away between red and blue. And what this boundary represents is if you see these weights, if you can see here, it's saying 0.95x1 and some weight on x2 that is giving you this linear decision boundary in the two-dimensional space. If you look at a slightly more complicated example, which is the one we had on the slides, we try to find a boundary, it doesn't really work because there isn't really a boundary that minimizes the cost function. There is no linear boundary that can separate out those points. So what we did was we, we had added a layer and instead of a linear activation, we had applied a ReLU activation Sorry, all right. Actually, one more. And that's it. And you can see what's happening here. The intermediate neurons are learning this nonlinear function. So previously, uh, the white sort of indicates zero. So whenever the value of the input is uh, less than zero, it uh, sort of thresholds it down to zero. So each of these neurons itself is nonlinear, and a combination of these three boundaries, again weighted by some parameters, is giving you this nonlinear outcome. Let's look at an even more complicated example. Let's try to do the same. Sort of as what it's doing right now is sort of, you can see something, some sort of a number running up over here. It's taking more and more examples of training data and trying to see if I, it can find these weights so, so as to classify those blue and orange dots correctly. It's quite, kind of not able to do that in this example. So let's add a few more. Uh, 
All right. So this happens quite often that uh, you don't change the model. You try it five times, it uh, just works out. Uh, so what you can see here is, uh, again, if you look at these hidden layers, what's happening is the first layer is clearly a linear combination of x1, x2 is a straight line. The second layer is a little bit more complicated, sort of nonlinear. Third is sort of, again, even more complicated function of the middle layer. And that's what is giving you, allowing you to classify this fairly complex uh, scatter of orange and uh, blue points. Let's look at the sort of most complicated example available here, is to be able to classify this uh, spiral pattern. And it's just not gonna work, because just too complicated a pattern uh, to be solved by uh, these, these few uh, neurons and these few layers. So what I'm going to do is, it's gonna keep trying, but it's not going to succeed. So I'm going to add and you see slowly what's going to happen is again as before some of the early layers are picking up fairly simple uh, functional concepts straight lines essentially the middle layers are now starting to pick up fairly complicated uh, combinations of these simple concepts to ultimately be able to sort of learn this spiral, a function that sort of learns the, this uh, pattern of orange and blue dots. And sort of you can see that uh, I think it has pro probably done as much as it could have done. And sort of you can see sort of different weights that it has learned for all of these connections which are, so just to sort of bring back, we're talking about neural networks, but nothing are nothing but these functions of parameters w that interact with input x. So the function is this architecture that we have decided, which has these four layers with six neurons each, uh, with some ReLU activations, and w's are these weights that are being learned by uh, sort of to fit the training data. So let's uh, come to the question of how exactly is it learning these Ws. So we sort of can sort of make a sense, intuitively what's happening is the more training data that we are giving it, it's updating these Ws to be able to uh, uh, sort of create a function that looks closer to our training data. But what, how exactly mathematically is that happening? Let's take a look at uh, those details. All right. So what's happening here behind the scenes is we started with this cost function. We wanted Ws that minimize the loss between our predictions and the known labels and the expectation of this loss over all possible Xs. Now we can't have all possible Xs. All possible Xs, uh, X means all possible images in the world or all possible those uh, scattered dots in the world. And that might be arbitrarily large. I mean, we may not simply not have that much training data. So what the best, next best thing we can do is probably we have access to some M samples of images or M samples of scatter points. So instead of uh, calculating a cost function, we are going to approximate the cost function with this sample of points available to us. Now, there are a few different ways to define the loss function. And this is again part of designing your uh, algorithm. This very simple example of a loss function could simply be a square difference. So the predicted value, the actual value in a squ square of their difference. That's a simple mean squared error. There might be other more complicated uh, loss functions. One example is cross entropy. So you define the loss function. Uh, you have a way to calculate the cost function, which is the average of the loss function over available samples. And now what you're trying to do is iteratively update the value of the parameters w. And this is again very simple gradient descent where we are saying that we are assigning the value of W to its existing value and we are moving towards, we are moving in a direction same as the gradient of the cost function with this parameter. So the gradient of the cost function J uh, with the parameter W, we want to move in this direction uh, with some learning rate eta. So all we need to do now is sort of figure out how do we do a derivative of the cost function with these parameters. And this is how we do it. So we have sort of this network, inputs, a whole bunch of weights in three layers, and we have the output at the end. 
and we can calculate the loss of the output with the actual label. And all you have to do now is calculate derivative of that loss. Let us say we are trying to de calculate derivative of that loss with respect to this weight over here, right at the start. Probably the most complicated example because if you, once you can do that end-to-end -end example, everything in the middle is a simpler version of the same. And calculating this derivative, again, very simple. This math is nothing new. This is old chain rule. Uh, if you have sort of multiple paths through which the weight W uh, interacts with the loss, then the, sort of you can use chain rule to figure out what the derivative is. Essentially, we're taking derivative loss with Y cap, Y cap with U2, U2 has sort of three paths, so you take derivative with all three of these, and so on. You add up all the derivatives through the paths, you finally have a derivative of U01 with the W. And this sort of, you apply this chain rule to get the derivative of loss with respect to the parameter that you want to change. And you just repeat this exercise for every single parameter, every single weight in your network. Uh, looks, I mean, uh, fairly complicated. Looks uh, like we are, we have to do a lot in every iteration of W for every single W, but a lot of this is repetitive. You can imagine that uh, once I know the derivative of loss with respect to W1, during the process I might have already calculated derivative loss with respect to some of the weights in the earlier layer. So a lot of this is redundant. So when you sort of write out these things, uh, you don't actually need to do these calculations for every single weight. If you've done it for sort of shallow layers, you have already done a lot of the math that's required for the deeper layers. All right, so we have figured out a way to optimize these parameters W, but we haven't quite found how do we figure out the right function F. So in our example, we started with a single layer network, a double layer network, a three layer with six neurons each. We changed the depth, we changed the width. Uh, there are a few different activation functions. There are a few different loss functions. I've not spoken about regularization, but there are other parts of the architecture that change the way you regularize uh, these networks so they don't overfit. And this is sort of the question of, we know a way to find the parameters W for a function or an architecture F, but we don't quite know how to choose the right architecture F. And the best, uh, unfortunately, the best way to do that is uh, to give this to your graduate student and hopefully they return back in a week and uh, they have descended to the right architecture. I mean, again, this is one of those things where uh, there might be in simpler, uh, for simpler problems, there might be some bounds and proofs available for uh, what the right function should be, right architecture should be. There, are, there is some research on how to uh, sort of iteratively change the architecture to get the optimal architecture, but this is still a work in progress. A lot of the new papers that come out are often, you know, a lot of trial and error, a lot of iteratively going over w architectures one by one, and you just find something that really does well for your problem statement. Uh, so a lot of this is grunt, ex excruciating work, unfortunately. But it also means for the community here, there is a lot of research that can be done to figure out how to do these things better. And this relates to some of the open research questions uh, on, on the optimization uh, end of uh, these, these networks. So we can imagine that uh, th there is potential for research to figure out what kind of architectures are more suited to these gradient descent algorithms where uh, the gradient descent itself finds as a local mina minima which is low enough, which is small enough or close enough to the global minima. Then we can think about architectures uh, with no or at least few saddle points, cliffs, or exploding gradients, which again helps uh, the gradient descent often find the global minima. And similarly, again, there is a lot of uh, ongoing work on finding uh, convergence properties and guarantees on some of these special uh, architectures, but there's a lot that needs to be done to sort of generalize this to all kind of architectures that we are using today in practice, but we don't necessarily have guarantees on. Okay, so that was uh, a simple, fully connected deep network. Now we are going to extend that to uh, apply this network on images. And we'll see why the fully connected version that I showed uh, isn't quite, doesn't quite work great for images. So we'll show sort of a variant of that, which is called convolutional deep network, which is going to be a lot better for images.
Okay. So let's relate this to what we did before. We did this example before where we had some orange and blue dots and we're trying to classify uh, these colors. Now we had come into an example where we have, whole, instead of every single dot, scatter dot, we have these images. And we're trying to classify whether there's a dog in the image or not. And you see a whole bunch of, we have a whole bunch of images available where we know the label, where we know whether there's a dog or not. So there are four images in the middle which are sort of blue classified, that they do have a dog, and there are four images sort of outside uh, where we have a label available that there is no dog. And each one of this image in this example is 1024 cross 720. So instead of solving a two-dimensional problem, we effectively now we want to solve a 737,280 uh, dimensional problem, almost a million dimensional problem. So clearly it's much, much more complicated than the two-dimensional problem that we had before. Every image is a point in this million dimensional space. So one thing that we could do is, you know, just repeat what we did before. Uh, we just take this image, we flatten it to a vector of a million dimension. And we feed this into the fully connected network. Just like we feed it in two features, we just feed in the million features into this fully connected network. And this might even work out. If you have enough training data, enough labeled images to classify, let's say, whether an image has clouds in it or not, uh, you provided 10 million training images, this will probably work out. But you can sort of imagine that there is a lot that is uh, wasted here. So one thing that's happening here is, if we just look at the first layer itself, the first layer that connects the input to the first hidden layer, every one of the vector dimensions is connected to every one of these three hidden layers, which means that there are about 2.2 million parameters in the first layer itself. So we are, we are trying to build a, we are trying to optimize a network where we have to find optimal values of a few million parameters. Obviously I'm going to take maybe 10 million images to be able to find optimal values for those parameters. So let's see if there is a way to uh, sort of look at how humans do this, how humans solve this uh, problem, to sort of get inspiration about how we should redesign the architecture so that we can do this task with way fewer parameters and therefore way fewer training samples. So one thing, let's, let's think of how a human would look at it. Let's say the human is asked to see if there are clouds on this image or not. What we are sort of, we sort of gaze through the image and we are looking for the specific pattern. We are looking for these squiggly lines which are gray or white together in this bunch. That's the pattern that we are looking for. And we repeatedly look for that pattern throughout that image. So that's something that's very similar to a convolutional operation. I'm going to describe what the convolution operation is and then we are going to utilize this operation within our network. And the idea with the convolutional network is fairly simple, that you have this convolutional filter. In this example, it's a three cross three filter, which is being applied on a five cross five image. The filter starts from top left, and it does an element-wise multiplication and produces an output. So you can imagine it's sort of two multiplied by zero, three multiplied by one, four multiplied by zero. So there are nine multiplications all of that added together gives you a 17. And you sort of repeat, you sort of move this filter all over your image, and you convolve a five cross five image to get an output of three cross three image. And what this operation is doing is, if you look at the filter, it has ones at the end and a minus four in the middle. So essentially, it will really highlight parts of the image which have a huge jump or disruption in the pixel values. So the first sort of chunk that we look at here, you can see that there is a huge disruption in the pixel values. It goes from four to zero to nine. So it's bright, zero is dark, and nine is bright again. And therefore the convolution filter really uh, creates an output of 17, which is sort of a large value. That it has detected that in this window of the image, there's a large disruption of the pixel values. If you look at the example right below zero, uh, that sort of indicates that in that patch of image, there isn't a disruption of pixel values. So this sort of, this uh, patch here has a 1, 1, 3, a 0, 1, 0. Uh, it's sort of fairly continuous patch of pixel values. So what this essentially is doing with an example is, 
It's taking an input image and it's finding edges in that image. Edges in the image are places where there is a huge change in pixel values. And this convolutional filter is able to sort of blur out all the contiguous patches and just focus on areas of the image where there's a huge disruption in pixel values. So let's see how do we, how do we now use this in our uh, deep network. I mean, this is deep learning, so we sort of always like to put uh, these modules over and over and ag uh, again in a deep sort of setting. So that's what we are going to do again. So f what we do here is, this is our input image, five cross five. So instead of connecting the input image to, uh, with weights uh, to the next layer, we're going to use this two cross two filter. If we had used a fully connected architecture like before, we would have wanted to connect every one of these inputs to every one of these hidden layer units. So that would have meant 25 inputs, each connected to 16 outputs, uh, which would have meant 400 different parameters. Now we are going to use a convolution filter, which just has four parameters instead of 400. So way fewer parameters. Essentially, that convolution filter is moving across that image and creating this four cross four output. We add another layer of convolution filters. This time we have a convolution filter of three cross three, which again sort of moves over the second layer and creates this third layer of two cross two. We flatten this two cross two in a four cross one vector. As before, we can have a fully connected layer after this and a softmax function to do a classification. Classification for with either zero or a one. We can do a bit more. So sort of the intuition for having these filters is that they're trying to pick out certain patterns. So we looked at an example where they were picking out edges. But surely to do more complicated tasks, we need, more, we need to pick out more than one pattern. We may want to pick out edges. We may want to pick out circles, uh, maybe blobs. We may want to pick out uh, horizontal edges versus vertic vertical edges and so on. So one filter may not be enough. So we're gonna place multiple such filter banks at every step. So at the first step, I get an input of five cross five image. I place two filters, each two cross two, which creates two filter maps. On one input, it creates two filter maps because there are two filters. Next layer, again, I use two filters of three cross three. Now I have four, uh, four filter maps. And I can typically do some sort of pooling operation to reduce the dimensions. I can do a pooling operation uh, on, a, on a single filter map, or I can do a pooling operation across the filter maps to sort of reduce the dimension from uh, this four cross four cross four down to just four. And I again flatten it, fully connected layer, soft max, get my output. Sort of what's happening intuitively is something like this. So in the earlier layer, you have a whole bunch of these filters. In this example, you have, I don't know, a few dozen filters in the first layer which are trying to pick out fairly simple edges. Edges, uh, some of, most of them are edges, some of them are circular patterns, uh, other kind of patterns, maybe some black patterns and so on. The filters in the middle of the network are picking out slightly more complicated features. So if you're thinking of images which have uh, faces on them, these filters are picking out combination of edges and circles, which might be now lips and ears and eyes and parts of the face. And finally, much, much deeper layer are sort of combining all of this to pick out the entire face, different types of faces. Let's look at a very nice example for what these networks look like. All right, so what's happening here is uh, there's an input image, which is a handwritten digit, and it's trying to classify whether the handwritten digit is zero, one, two, three, four, which of these digits is it? And sort of this is a fully connected example. This is not convolutional filters. Sorry, yeah. And you, you can sort of see here what's happening, sort of every single pixel on the image is connected to every single uh, unit on this hidden layer, and so on and so on. So there are a lot of weights in this network. And finally, it's connected to a softmax at the end. 
uh, right there at the end, where it's sort of saying that it's very likely to be a three, but it might also be some likelihood of it being a two. So it's sort of doing a multi-class classification into one of 10 classes. So as a digit changes, its prediction is also changing. And uh, the applications of the weights and the pixel value sort of changing the activations throughout the network. OK, so this is an example of a convolutional filter in the same problem. OK, so again, you have the input on this side, uh, starting from the left. And what's happening here is you can see five, there are 25 filters in the first layer which is essentially creating 25 versions of the input, 25 filter maps of the input. And each of these filter maps are slightly different. So they're trying to pick out different kinds of edges and features from this image. Then we have another layer of convolution right after this, which is applied on the first filter maps to get another set of filter maps right behind it. Sort of visualizing these intermediate layer can sometimes help you understand or interpret what the model is trying to do. And finally, the second filter maps is linked to a fully connected layer of softmax function to predict one of 10 values. It's hard to see here, uh, but generally this sort of a network will have way fewer parameters than the fully connected one that I just showed. All right. So this is uh, the actual network that was proposed in 1999 by Jan LeCun to do uh, image classification using convolutional neural networks. One of the first examples of uh, fairly deep networks used for image classification. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're not going to go through the entire network. Now, these things are going to become significantly complicated as we go along. But if you want, you want to take sort of, you want to focus on the first layer itself. We have an input of a 32 cross 32 image. In the first set of feature maps, we have six feature maps, each with 28 cross 28 dimensions. If you sort of interpret back and think about the convolution operations, what hap what's happening here is the first layer has, a, has six convolutional filters, each with a dimension of five cross five. There's a little bit of math there. What's happening is if you minus 32 minus 28 plus one, that's the dimensionality of the filter that you would have applied on the input. Uh, you don't need to be worried about that, but sort of something that you can figure out by just looking at what the input is and what the output is. But what you can certainly see is there are six filter maps created out of one input. So you are potentially, you are probably applying six different filters on the input image. The next time around you're applying, you're sort of applying more filters, getting 16 filter, ma uh, filter maps. Again, more filter maps in the third layer fully connected layers, and then a softmax at the end to classify into one of 10 categories. This entire network has 60,000 parameters. I think there are a few versions of uh, this model around, so I don't know if this specific version is 60,000, but approximately a few tens of thousands of parameters. And most of these parameters, if you look at it, sort of ends up being in the fully connected layers. There are very few parameters that are in the convolutional filters. If the first layer has five, six, five cross five filters, that means 150 parameters, that's all. The second layer probably also has a few hundred parameters. It's only the last few fully connected layers that have a whole bunch of these parameters. So this sort of, this idea of classifying images really exploded a decade back. And since then, a lot of research has been done on this competition called the ImageNet. And the problem statement in ImageNet is to classify 1.2 million training images into one of 1,000 categories. And this is a very, very complicated task. I myself, I don't think I would be able, I would have figured out that this was a Madagascar cat, that this was a mite. Uh, I, pro I probably would figure out maybe five or six of these 10. So this is fairly complicated. Uh, most people may not be able to match how well the deep learning algorithms will do on this. Uh, even experts may not be able to do as well as the deep learning networks. And this is sort of progress we have seen in the last 10 years. We have very shallow networks that were proposed in 2010 and 2011, which had an error rate of 28.2%. I'm going to give a fuzzy meaning of the error rate. It sort of means that 
of every 100 images you are being asked to classify, you're making a mistake on 28. The definition, exact definition is a little bit more complicated, but you can imagine that's sort of the easy interpretation of the error rate. As you can see, since then, 2012, 13, 14, we have had new networks that have pushed down the error rate of 3.57%, which means that we are saying that of every 100 image, uh, these networks are getting 97 of the image right in classifying that image into one of 1,000 categories. It's a fairly complicated task. So this is uh, the 2012 network. Again, I'm not gonna go through what's happening here. Uh, 22 to four, cross two to four image, whole bunch of uh, uh, weights in eight layers, a few uh, million parameters. Uh, one nice aspect that, that was used by this uh, network was called dropouts. It's a very interesting idea, sort of gives us uh, one example of various ways people regularize these networks, which means that penalize overfitting in these networks. And the idea here is that if you think of a fully connected network with a whole bunch of weights, what they do is in any iteration while you're learning these weights, you randomly drop out a whole bunch of these weights. You just wipe them out. So what you're forcing it to do is you're forcing the network to make predictions without, without being able to use all its pattern recognition. You're saying that you know you get on this iteration, you get to use only half of your weights, but you should still be able to make the classification even though half the weights are not available to you. So think of this example. Think of trying to classify polar bears from brown bears. And there are various, once you get an algorithm that's good at this classification, you don't really know on what basis the classification is being made. It might simply be made based on the snow versus the grass. So next time I show it, uh, let's say some sort of a animal, some other animal on snow, it might say it's a polar bear. Because if this is all the training that it has received, it sort of will see that it may interpret that a polar bear is nothing but ice. It's just white background is polar bear. Because that's the only kind of polar bear examples it has seen. It's also possible that it's doing the classification just on the white, uh, the white fur of the polar bear and the brown fur of the brown bear, which is still not enough. I might have an Eskimo on ice who is wearing some white fur and the algorithm will say it's a polar bear. What I really want this algorithm to be doing is to sort of figure out very nuanced classifying differences between polar bears and brown bears. Not just they are always on snow, that they are white, but more maybe about uh, how they look, maybe their orientation of their eyes, ears, and things like that. In order to do that, I use dropouts. What I'm sort of doing with these dropouts is I'm saying that, sure, there's a part of the network or some of these weights that are focusing on patterns of the fur color or the background. But if I suddenly drop out those weights, I want, I want some sort of redundancy. I want the network to be able to focus on multiple classifying differences. So even if I throw out some of the classifying differences, the network can still do a good job. And that's what I'm trying, that's what these, uh, this model tried to do with dropouts. It's been a, a technique that's been very popular since then. Yet another example, as the networks keep getting uh, deeper and deeper, you have 19 layers with 138 million parameters in VGGNet. Uh, this is a residual network, uh, so you sort of compared with VGG, uh, which sort of makes the VGG layers look rather sparse. Uh, the ResNet has 152 layers. I mean, this particular version only has 34, but I think one of their versions had 152 layers. Another interesting concept that they came up with in this network is the idea of skip connections. Sort of you can see you're skipping over some layers instead of using all layers. And this has to do with the problem of vanishing gradient. What happens with very, very deep networks is uh, once you start calculating a derivative of the loss with respect to some of these weights, the derivative becomes too small. This happens is because you are applying these nonlinear activations like the softmax function. Uh, sorry like the softmax function. And derivative of the softmax function, which is shown in the red uh, dashed line, is less than one, it's small. You take the derivative over 150 softmax functions, the final derivative is going to be very, very, very small. So even if you're trying to optimize a parameter in a shallow layer, it's going to move towards the optimal value very, very slowly. So you might never really reach there. And therefore, these skip connections help sort of 
close that loop, sort of not having to go through the layers and activations every time. So if the classifying problem or part of the problem is simple enough, it doesn't require that many layers. In those examples, it's going to skip, skip those layers and make sure that it doesn't have to go through all those uh, derivatives of those 150 layers. Again, another sort of this interesting concept uh, within many architectures that's been used again and again uh, in uh, following uh, applications in deep learning. Uh, Google Net, again, uh, it uses an interesting module called Inception Network. I'm not going to go into that, uh, but again, something that has been repeated, sort of the module that has been repeated uh, again and again. So if you can see this, this sort of this module is something they call the Inception Network. It's repeated again and again in this network. And this is sort of uh, some idea around trying to figure out what kind of filter dimensions are more, most appropriate for a specific task. But you should be able to decide that while learning instead of having to decide it before. So un until now, we have been making a choice of the convolutional filters beforehand. We said that, you know, I'm going to apply three cross three filters or five cross five filters. But maybe you want to learn that during training itself. Whether a one cross one filter is good, a three cross three is good, or a five cross five is good, something you might want to learn during training. So that's sort of the intuition of using uh, an inception network. Okay, so, so far, all the problems that we have discussed have basically done classification of images. And now we are going to go a little further than that. Uh, we are going to look at examples of describing an image. Uh, we are going to look at how, uh, the, how the model could tell us what parts of the image is paying attention on. And we are going to talk about how we can generate completely new image, new art from some of these networks. So this is going to be tasks that are significantly more complicated than classification uh, into two categories or 10 categories. So this is one, one, of, uh, one of these tasks. And the idea is to describe an image. You have an image input on the left. Uh, you have this network that I will describe soon in the middle. And you have a textual description of what's happening in the image. A group of people shopping at an outdoor market and so on. And the basic idea here is that we had this, these networks earlier, where we had these layers, convolutional layers or fully connected layers, but right at the end, we were always sort of connecting them through a softmax to do a binary classification, or through a softmax to do a 10-way classification. These are sort of 10 categories of outputs that were available to us. But now we don't want this 10-way or two-way classification. We want to be able to generate entire sentences at the end. So we're going to throw out sort of that last layer that's doing a two-way or a 10-way classification. Instead, we are going to replace that with language models, something that can take that second last layer, which I've highlighted in blue, throw out the softmax, instead generate language out of it. Sort of describe what, has, what that second last layer has found. And the language model is something that is done using an RNN, a recursive neural network and ve many variants of it. Now this is a sort of an entire topic on its own, how RNN work and how they generate natural language, uh, how they work on text data. So I'm not obviously, uh, I'm not gonna go into details of that in this tutorial, but the idea is yet another, it's a yet another uh, neural network. What it's trying to do is, it's trying to predict a sentence of length capital T, and at every step, it's trying to predict the, the tth word of the sentence given the image and all the words that it has, it has predicted before. So if you look at example of a sentence, so it's looking at this image, it has to predict the first word. It sees that all the training data that I have, in my training data I have a whole bunch of images with a whole bunch of descriptions. I see that most of the descriptions start with an A or a D. Most sentences start with an A or a D. So it just predicts A at the start. Then it sees that, okay, now mostly, most descriptions follow an A with some sort of, you know, the main object in the image, the main noun, the main person in the image. So it has to figure out what sort of person should, is, is there in my image. So it sees that in my training image, whenever there are a whole bunch of human looking patterns, then it's a good way to describe them as a group of people. So it follows up A with a group of people. So it has used its image, it has used the training data on how similar images are described in the past 
to say that it's a group of people. Then it knows that typically descriptions uh, where you have you have sort of uh, out you already have an output of the noun. It's followed by some sort of verb. What are what is this person doing? And once again, it looks at this image, similar images, and it sees that you know a likely description of the verb is maybe shopping, selling, sitting. These are very likely uh, words that describe the verb that's happening in this image, and sort of picks out one of those, say as the a group of people shopping, and so on and so forth. So at every step, it's using the image, it's using what output it has produced in the sentence before this, and sort of trying to see what is the most likely output that makes sense, is sensible uh, in the next step. So I've not spoken about what, what do we mean by an input of a word and output of a word, but I'll just give a very basic idea. What's happening here is every word is being represented as this huge vector which has the width of the entire English language vocabulary, a uh, few hundred thousand uh, dimensional vector. Every word is represented by a single one and the rest of them being zero. And uh, people, for example, let's say, uh, is represented by a vector which is 100,000 dimension, which has a one at position 6,432. So that's the representation of the word people. That word is, an input to a recursive neural network, which is just yet another neural network with some deep layers that's going to take this input x, apply a whole bunch of weights, get an output y. And in this case, the output happens to be a one at, say, location 16,463, which happens to map with the word shopping. And the idea is by looking at a whole bunch of training examples, the RN will try to learn these weights in the middle so that it makes sensible predictions about the next word using the previous word. And this is what the entire network will look like. So you, will, you have this convolution network at the beginning, starting with the image, applying convolution filters, some fully connected layers. You have these hidden units, which are often also in this context called embedding of the image. It sort of captures all information about the image. Now you use these embeddings through this convolution network into the RNN. The RNN is sort of using the zeroth word you can think of as a tag for start of sentence. So it's sort of taking the previous word, outputting the next word, then taking word one, outputting the second word, taking word two, outputting the third word, and so on. Sort of it keeps rolling to create the sentence going forward. And this entire network, the weights in the convolutional layers, the fully connected layers, the weights in the RNN, all will be simultaneously optimized with a whole bunch of training data where you already have images and descriptions available. So that if a new image were to become available, then you can uh, describe that new image as well. This is a little bit uh, more difficult. Uh, the previous one is uh, part of this paper called show and tell model. The next one is show, attend, and tell. And the idea is you don't want to just describe the image. You want to also know what part of the image is the model paying attention to for describing a specific word. So this is a bit involved. What's happening here is first, the more we are trying to model whether I should be, so I, so I stands for uh, a patch of image. So the first thing that we're trying to do is whether I'm at time t or the word t, am I paying attention to the patch i based on the image, the entire image, and all the words that I have outputted before. So first I see whether I should pay attention to a patch of image or not. Then I create this attention, which is a weighted sum of all the image features, so that I'm only, so ZT essentially captures the part or the image features that I, I want to pay attention to, and sort of ignores everything else beside it. And now I'm going to model the prediction for the next word in the sentence in a description. Instead of using the image, I'm going to just use the attention, that I'm just attending to this part of the image, and this is sufficient for me to be able to predict what word I should use. And so what's happening in this example is, uh, as you see it word by word, uh, when it's man is sort of, the attention is towards a boy that's somewhere on the corner. When it's a woman, the attention shifts to the woman. Uh, when it's frisbee, the attention should shift to the frisbee. I don't think it's shifting, uh, but that's typically you would expect that you will get some sense of what parts of the image the model is attending to 
to be able to output a specific word. And you, you would ideally expect these things to match up. These are the sort of make the models more interpretable. That you can sort of, uh, you have a lot more confidence that this is something rational. There's something reasonable happening behind the scenes. But uh, once again, these, are, these things are not very accurate. So time to time you might be confused why it's attending to some part of the image which has nothing to do with the word it's outputting. But on occasions, it might also be helpful in interpreting the model. An even more difficult example is uh, visual question answering, where you're given an image. Uh, let's say in the left image, you are asked a question, what kind of store is this? Or is the display case as full as it could be? Fairly complicated sentences. So you want a model that looks at the image and the question and gives a natural language answer a full text sentence as an answer to these questions. The, the actual model is fairly complicated, but this sort of captures the intuition of what's happening behind the scene. So you have on the top an image input, a whole bunch of convolution layers, which creates these sort of second last layer uh, of the networks that we have seen, we call the image embeddings. Similarly, we have this question, we create these vectors for every word, we combine them in some fashion using some weights. We create a question embedding. We have an answer, which is again, let's say we are answering with a single word. We again create an answer embedding. We combine them in some fashion using some weights and some parameters in some architecture. And we finally train all of these weights using these true or false labels. Whether the answer is correct or not, given this image and this question. And the hope is that by doing this training, simultaneously we will learn what's the best representation of images into image embeddings, what is the best representation of sentences into question embeddings, what's the best representation of answers, what is the right answer, and what is the best representation of answers into answer embeddings. We are hoping that we have enough training samples and that we have a good architecture that we sort of learn all these weights by using the same chain rule. So every time we are going to figure out the loss function, we're going to take the derivative of the output with respect to every single weight on this, para on, on this architecture. And we are hoping that we will learn uh, all of this simultaneously in a single go. Again, looks like a fairly complicated exercise. If you have enough of these questions and answers available to you, uh, if you have a huge GPU or a TPU where you can uh, do billions of computations at a very fast pace, these things are achievable. One thing I want to note here is uh, what is, we have sort of gone from uh, simple classification tasks to generative tasks. So first we were just classifying or discriminating between images, one of two classes, one of 10 classes. But now we are generating entire sentences. So this is a generate, now we have gone to generative models of language. You can imagine a similar sort of uh, idea of a generative model of images. What if I wanted to generate an entire image? So if you think of an image, uh, let's say a 640 cross 480 image, a colored image typically has three channels, red, green, blue. So we are talking about 921,000 dimensional image. It's about a million dimensions. Every single one of those dimensions can take 255 values. So we are saying that to be able to generate a new image, I need to learn probability distribution over that support, which is supported over that many points. 255 raised to the power of 921,000, a million. That's just arbitrary large number. A probability distribution that for me to learn, for me to build an architecture that learns that high dimensional a probability distribution, I, I, it's sort of, I need uncountable number of images to be able to do that. So we're going to look at networks and sort of nice tricks in which we break down images into simpler components so that we can achieve this, uh, we can solve this task. We know that we can't sort of, you know, we can't use brute force to learn that high probability distribution. It's a very just, dimensionality of the problem is too large. So we're going to reduce the dimensionality of the problem. And I'm going to hope that in this latent low dimensional representation, I can solve this task while I may not, be, uh, I may not uh, be able to solve it in, in the high di original high dimension. So there's one uh, network that uh, does this. We're gonna talk about two networks if we 
have time. Uh, the first network that does this is very, very popular is Generative Adversarial Net, again. Uh, what's happening here is I want a generator, which is a neural network. Uh, again, I've shown fully connected weights, but it could be convolutional weights and a whole bunch of 10 layers and so on. I want to feed it in, the input I want to feed is white noise, just random white noise. I want a network which is essentially parameterized by phi. I want a network to produce realistic images. And you can imagine, at the start, that's not going to happen. I mean, I'm, I'm feeding in garbage. I, I have my phi's initialized to garbage. So garbage multiplied by garbage is just going to produce just random set of pixel values which mean nothing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make this generator compete with another neural network, a discriminator. I'm going to hope that the competition between two neural networks is going to make both of them really good at their tasks. What the second uh, neural network is trying to do is discriminate whether an image is a real image or a fake image. So let's say I have a whole bunch of real, image, real images, photographs that are actually taken in the world. And I have a whole bunch of fake images that are created by this generator using noise as an input, essentially hallucinated by the generator. These are photographs that look like photographs, but they aren't really photographs taken in the real world. And I'm going to hope the discriminator can differentiate whether the input that I'll feed in comes from a generator or whether it comes from real data. Initially, because the generator is producing garbage, the discriminator's job is quite easy. It has to differentiate garbage from things that look like real images. It's not a very hard task to perform. Now, what, what we are going to do is essentially iteratively train a generator and a discriminator again and again. So first, we train the generator so that it can fool the discriminator. So its image producing ability becomes slightly better, its weights sort of become slightly better, so that its image start looking like real world images. Just enough so that it can fool the discriminator into not figuring out whether it's a real image or a fake image. Then we train the discriminator to become even better at discerning. Discerning real images versus you know, something that looks noisy kind of like real images. So as we sort of make these things compete against each other, sort of trying to optimize this uh, cost function, which is the function of both the parameters theta of the discriminator and the phi of the generator, we'll sort of have these, uh, iteratively we will sort of go through these, uh, we'll have these examples uh, during, the, during the learning process where initially you have these faces, uh, sure you can call them faces, but if you look at them closely they are I mean, they're not realistic. They're all kinds of patchy and grainy and uh, sort of misoriented kind of uh, faces. And as the generator becomes better and better at creating realistic looking images that fool the discriminator, these images start looking realistic. Just, I want you to know that the pictures on the right are hallucinated completely. These are not real people. These are not ever taken in, the, these photographs are not taken in the real world. But you know, you just look at them it looks like it might be a celebrity, it might be uh, something that has actually been captured. And a more, I guess, uh, a lighter side, this is an example of the generative adversarial network being used to create art. I think this piece of art sold for a few hundred thousand dollars, and you can see sort of it's signed, instead of a name, it's signed by the cost function itself. A more realistic example, a really cool application of this is uh, adding resolution to a low resolution image. You're starting with this image, and let's say you don't, have a, you don't have the original high resolution version. You're starting with this, and you want the generative adversarial network to hallucinate the details of this image. And you can see, sort of, if you look at some of the patterns, like uh, if you see the hat and uh, around the neck, there's some sophisticated patterns there which are not visible on the low resolution image. And the GAN essentially hallucinates these ornamental artistic patterns on clothing. Uh, of course, these are not, these don't turn out to be the same as what was there in the original image. But if you had just looked at this image, it may very well seem like a realis realistic ornamental pattern of clothing that uh, may have been uh, true in the original image. So of course it's not going to be able to recreate the original image, but it's going to create a fake uh, version of the details that looks very, very realistic. 
The second uh, example is, the second way to sort of accomplish generation of these images is called variational autoencoders. I'll go through this very briefly because we are sort of running out of time. Uh, these uh, variational autoencoders or VAEs uh, depend on a sort of underlying sort of architecture for this is similar to autoencoders. And the idea is that in these autoencoders, you feed in images from one side, whole bunch of convolutional filters in between. You have this intermediate output Z, which is the encoded version of the input, typically low dimensional than the input itself. And then you have a decoder, which generates the image back. And what this uh, entire thing is trying to do is trying to make sure that this output image matches the input image, even though the output is, having, is being decoded from a very low dimensional representation. This is like PCA, uh, principal component analysis. So what we are doing is, instead of a high dimensional image, we are compressing it to low dimensions, and we are hoping that the encoder Oh, sorry, the decoders weights can get me back the high resolution image uh, from these uh, latent dimension. This is what uh, sort of ends up happening. You have these examples of handwritten digits. Each of these images are, let's say, 16 cross 12. Uh, each of these images are now being compressed into two dimensions. Each of these scatter uh, points belongs to one uh, handwritten image. And what happens is, every digit sort of occupies its own area in this space. In this latent two-dimensional space, it sort of has this, its own unique uh, area in the space that it's occupying. And you can see some examples. Uh, let's see, there is a three in orange, and there is a green, gray, eight. Eight and three are close by. You can imagine that three kind of looks like an eight, with a little bit of an addition. So there's some sort of logic in here that uh, intuitively, you can sort of understand this as, you know, this, this, we don't exactly know what the dimension of latent space means, but we know that if two points are close together, probably their images were close together as well. So you can sort of follow, sort of lead this into the next argument that if I were to pick out a new point on the space, let's say somewhere between a three and a eight, and I want to decode that back to an image, my image should look something like a three and an eight. And, an eight. and that's the idea with variational autoencoders. So I'm going to take images of faces or rooms or something like that. I'm going to encode it into low dimensions and decode that back into uh, full images. And I'm going to hope that once I have done this encoding and decoding, if I pick new points on this latent space and I use the decoder on these new points, the decoder is going to hallucinate completely new images new faces, new rooms that have never been seen before. But the small trick lies is that the encoder, this autoencoder is not quite enough for this because I want these dimensions, these two dimensions to make, to have some sort of functional constraint on that. And that's something that's added by a VAE where it's, in this example, it's applying sort of a, a normal uh, distribution constraint on these latent dimensions. So this is, an ex again, an example of the algorithm learning to do better and better job of predicting, sort of hallucinating new digits. Again, on the right hand side, these digits were never really written by a human being. These are completely hallucinated by uh, the VAE, and they look like it could have been written by someone. Examples of room images, hallucinated, again, these rooms don't exist. Uh, these are completely hallucinated by the variational autoencoder. Typically what happens, sort of patterns you can see is, you know, in any given image, the bed might seem like uh, it is similar to some of the other images. The window looks like a similar to some other images. The, you know, the painting on the wall will seem like a similar to some other bunch of images. It's combining all these components together to sort of create something that's realistic. And all of, the, so all of this sort of goes into uh, one of the obvious applications for all of this is uh, the issues that we are seeing with deep fake videos and deep fake images. So this is pretty much what's used to create these things. But again, as researchers, we sort of need to figure out what are the adversarial methods to sort of discern whether these things are fake or these things are real. So to, to be able to do that in future, we need the understanding of how these uh, fake images and videos are created in the first place. 
All right. Uh, so we are on to the last uh, bit of this presentation. Any questions that I can answer in a couple of minutes? All right, I'll try to uh, complete this in uh, the remaining 15 minutes. Okay, so let's look at the idea of interpretability first. And there are three, there are various ways to explain or make sense of interpret, uh, interpretability, but I'll talk about three of those uh, uh, reasonable sort of common sense ways you can think of interpretability. One idea is that if you are given a model, uh, are you able to look at the model and its predictions and interpret the drivers of that prediction? Like what features of my input led to that prediction? And this is a simple example of a decision tree. Uh, these, uh, mach this machine learning model uh, ends up being fairly easy to interpret because you can sort of see that it has making these predictions of y is equal to one, zero, one. For any given prediction, you can sort of, sort of track back the tree to figure out why the prediction was made. It was made because x1 was greater than c and x2 was greater than c2, and therefore the prediction one was made. Fairly easy to interpret. But you sort of compare this with uh, some of the examples of the deep neural network. Uh, let's say there is a prediction made on, you know, what's the car model on this picture. You can't really tell from that what pixel values, what patches of pixel uh, were the drivers of this prediction. You can't really tell that from this example. Another example, another way sort of you can uh, discuss interpretability is whether uh, someone can realistically write out the calculations involved to come up with output, all the computations involved to come up with output. Again, you can do that for a linear regression, for a logistic regression, you can do that because you just multiply the inputs with some weights, you can literally write down the calculation on paper and sort of get a sense of, manually get a sense of what it's trying to do. Again, something that becomes unrealistic with these networks. I mean, you can probably start writing something at this end. I mean, this is not something, this is not so, sort of computation that anyone can fit into their head. Sort of interpret how exactly did I end up with this output. Yet another example, maybe if maybe you can't figure out the computations, uh, they're too hard, you can't figure out the drivers, but maybe at least you can make sense of what are we trying to optimize. So this is an example of linear regression where typically the cost function is has a unique minima. And imagine sort of you can explain this to a business manager perhaps. You can say that, uh, well, there are some scatter points. All I'm trying to do is try out different slopes and biases of this line. And I, as I keep trying iteratively many of these biases, I ultimately find a slope that fits. And that's, that's pretty much the cost function. Every point on the cost function is different value of the slope and the bias. So linear regression and its cost function is fairly interpretable. We know what it means to go towards the minima. So I'm sort of changing these slopes, and ultimately I get close to these points and I sort of see a good fit, which corresponds to a really low value on the cost function. Again, look at the VGG, the cost function for a VGG net. You can't really explain to them uh, sort of what many of these local minimas mean. Uh, what does it really, what guarantees do I have that this will actually go to the global minima? What kind of issues will I have with uh, finding uh, the uh, appropriate gradients toward the global minima? You can't really explain uh, any guarantees on this, uh, this algorithm to a business manager. So all of these reasons kind of make these deep learning models quite uninterpretable. So you don't expect a human to, uh, they can neither reasonably understand the overall function, FXW, uh, nor its optimization, nor separate out the roles played by individual features, XI on the prediction Y. And these are, this is sort of the primary reason why uh, typically these things are hard to interpret. And the reason we want these things to be interpretable is the example of the doctor who's receiving a prediction on, you know, a disease or some sort of, uh, uh, you know, a tumor on a MRI image. It's, it's way better for the doctor if a prediction comes with some sort of interpretation that I'm predicting this image or this uh, outcome because, you know, in this period during the last week, the blood pressure was high, body temperature was so much, which was followed by X, Y, Z. 
if you provide this sort of interpretation with the prediction, they're more likely to uh, use these algorithms over a long period of time and sort of adopt them in practice. So there are a few different ways to go about this. Again, this, uh, this is still work in progress. Uh, so there, is, there are ways in which you can interpret filters and intermediate layers in these deep networks. Uh, some of these examples are saliency maps, uh, layer activation visualizations, and so on. What I'll focus on, just one of them, is LIME. Uh, this is a method by Ribeiro and others. Uh, what this method tries to do is essentially figure out linear functions that are approximately same as the complex deep network, at least in some limited domain. So let's look at a visual example. So you have a deep network which has learned this complicated decision boundary between the red and the blue, this thing that's sort of uh, going, uh, the pattern that's throughout the image. And what we are saying is, if I want to explain why this particular prediction, this particular point was classified in the red region instead of blue region, I just want to interpret that specific point. What I can do is create a linear model in that vicinity. That linear model, if you look at it, it's fairly close to the deep model in the vicinity. The deep model is also fairly a straight line, and the linear model also kind of follows it. Of course, the linear model is not a good approximation throughout the space. The linear model will probably say that everything to the left is red, everything to the right is blue, which is clearly not the case. Like if you go far, it will probably would have said that this is the red point, and it would have said that uh, all of these are blue points. So it's not great approximation throughout globally, but it's a good enough approximation locally. And that's what we're trying to do. So we have this complex function G, but we are trying to find these interpretable linear, uh, perhaps linear functions that are at least locally approximate in the locality of some point X. And what you want to do is find out these, find out a bunch of these interpretable Fs. Now, we found this interpretable F that works for this vicinity. Sort of over here, I can sort of explain my findings using this linear model. Maybe I find a linear model over here, maybe something over here, maybe with like five or six different linear models, I can explain the overall complex function. But if I have too many of these, like if, if, I, if, the, comp, if the deep networks function is too complicated, that I'm having to explain its finding by 100 simpler linear functions, again, 100 is too many. That's not something that someone can uh, hold in their head, sort of see, sort of interpret all 100 linear functions together. So the hope is that I can find a reasonable, uh, reasonably few of these linear simple functions that are locally approximate, but overall together sort of give a global picture of the entire algorithm. This is a simple example where what they are able to do with the images is uh, this image is classified as electric guitar, acoustic guitar, Labrador, using Google's inception network. And then they are able to show the reasoning behind each prediction. They're saying it's classified as electric guitar because of these image patches. It's classified as acoustic guitar because of these image patches. Uh, I don't have expertise in guitar, probably something to do with uh, maybe some of these features that are in electric versus acoustic guitars. And finally, Labrador, because you know, there, is a, there is Labrador in the image. So it's finding image patches that make the prediction a lot more interpretable. But still remains an open question. Uh, should we be finding, should we be developing algorithms that are accurate? Or should we be developing algorithms that are less accurate but more interpretable? Well, it's not clear. I mean, you want to build trust, but also you don't want to lay, leave something on the table. If you're able to do a better prediction of MRIs, cancer or not, you know, you don't want to reduce the predictive power just because uh, someone feels more comfortable with it. So it's not clear how we should go about this. Maybe one approach could be you have to start with something interpretable and simple at the beginning. As people develop more and more trust on it, you try, start making it more and more complicated. Again, it remains an open uh, question of research. What's the right way to sort of incorporate this in an application? 
one obvious follow up uh, one would imagine is if I do have an interpretable deep learning model, uh, why not start using it in policy? So here's an example uh, where these are Airbnb uh, properties. And the deep learning model predicts the left ones to be low demand and the right ones to be high demand. And you can sort of imagine like the colors are a bit dull. And apparently in the, the bottom one, there's an issue with diagonal dominance. And I wouldn't have figured it out myself, but apparently photographers understand, uh, have expertise around this. And it seems that most people end up liking the one on the right because it sort of has sort of main object in the image is sort of diagonally dominant or something of that fashion. So this particular paper actually not only predicts the low and the high demand, but also finds the interpretable features for every single one of these predictions. Which of these sort of led to high image quality prediction? But unfortunately, what happens is if people rely on this algorithm to improve the quality of their images, they have an expectation that because the algorithm predicts high quality image to have higher demand, if they simply improve the quality of their images, they will get high demand, which does not happen. It doesn't happen because high demand, permanent high demand is not a function of image quality, it's a function of properties quality. If you don't invest in property quality, instead you only invest in photoshopping your image or getting a professional photographer to get a one-time awesome image, that's not going to translate into permanently high demand. And what actually counterintuitively starts happening is mediocre properties that get photoshopped, expert photograph images put up for their property actually reduce their demand. Because people visit these property with a much higher expectation of quality because of the images, they leave bad reviews, and the property ratings go down, and the demand goes down in the future. So this is an example, interesting example, where you have good prediction, you have interpretable features, but once people start using these predictions, the market's equilibrium shifts to a new setting, where the predictive model is not true anymore. And this is something that we need to be careful about. And this sort of leads into the issue of prediction versus causality. And sort of underlying issue here is that when we did the predictions, we didn't really model causal features behind high, high demand. We model features that are correlated with high demand, but do not cause high demand. And one, you know, um, some of this can happen because we don't model them, or it may happen because consumer preferences change, market structures change, and so on. There are a few ways to get around this. Again, very much an open uh, area of research, but you know you can always get more data that helps. Uh, maybe just think more about the features. A much sort of uh, left field idea is to go with randomized experiments. And these tend to be really bad in predictive power, but they're really good in making sure uh, whether a feature is, has causal effect on the output or not. And then there are structural econometric models, which I believe there's an entire tutorial on that on Tuesday where the idea is to have experts sort of build out uh, these models, but have flexible parts of the models that are learned by deep learning uh, from training data. I will not go into the depth of this. Again, uh, I guess we are running out of time. Uh, so what, one thing that I want to point out is sort of this causality is not necessarily just a burden. It's not sort of something that we just need to be cautious about. This might, just, might be an opportunity as well. So what we see is, if you think of a human, a child, and they're trying to learn, let's say, a difference between differentiating images of koalas and kangaroos. There are two ways they can learn that. One is you can show them a whole bunch of images of koalas and kangaroos, and they'll learn how to differentiate this. The second is you describe it to them. You describe to them that koalas have stout, tailless bodies and so on. Kangaroos have large, powerful hind legs and large feet and so on. Now, with this description, I, I guess a fairly mature child, maybe a 10, 12 years old child, should be able to differentiate images of koalas and kangaroos without ever having seen a single image of kang uh, kangaroo or koalas. So this is sort of a difference between learning to classify using examples or learning to classify using causal logic. And everything that we've seen in this tutorial so far has been the first type. We have learned to classify using a whole bunch of training examples, not using causal logic. And so sort of this sort of leads into, a, again, a sort of burgeoning area of research on one-shot learning. Like we shouldn't need a million examples to teach fairly basic things. 
cat versus dog shouldn't take a million examples. We learn it with like a couple of examples. Uh, why shouldn't uh, deep learning models be able to do that? So the idea is to be able to come up with these new architecture, new ways in which we can achieve learning with way fewer examples using some sort of a causal logic being given to the model. And finally, the issue of bias. Uh, these biases occur exactly for the same reasons why, same reasons that humans are biased, because in some manner or the other, we have had experiences in the past that are not fully representative of the population distribution, and often experience in the future fail to correct our biases because we have misspecified models to begin with. And this exact same reasoning uh, sort of applies to machine learning models as well. And this is uh, an example where uh, this camera software is unable to uh, distinguish, uh, sort of figure out if Asian people are blinking or not. This is uh, something that has been studied a lot in context of text data and uh, context of loans and crime and uh, these sort of socioeconomic issues. But the issue of bias hasn't really been discussed a lot in uh, context of computer vision. The kind of example that I want to leave you with is this idea of policing people who are jaywalking. Uh, you might have an awesome algorithm that you know, maybe issues tickets to people automatically uh, by predicting whether their, their sort of their gait and their walk is, should be considered jaywalking on the road or not. But you don't really know whether the prediction is being made because you know, the pattern of movement is wrong or because historically a lot of tickets have been issued to people of certain race or gender. You don't really know what aspect, what pattern of the image uh, this uh, visual monitoring, visual policing uh, algorithm is focusing on. So the big issue, I mean, we do, there is no clear way in which you can make an algorithm unbiased. It's a philosophical issue as well, because there are examples where you have ground truth, where you do know, uh, so in our previous example, we do know that this is a person blinking or not. But when you're talking about examples of jaywalking, we are talking about examples of who should a bank give loans to or not, it's not clear what the ground truth is. Uh, should we just say equal number of loans to all groups, all genders, all races, should we say, you know, we should develop an algorithm which doesn't include the feature about their race or gender? It's not clear what's the right way to go about this. So in, in any of these sort of ways of de-biased algorithm, we are introducing some sort of bias in the algorithm to correct for bias that's already existing in the social state. So it becomes a philosophical problem, what are we allowed to really uh, adjust in algorithms themselves? Uh, with that, I just I want to conclude the presentation. I wouldn't go into summarizing uh, a lot, and uh, I want you to thank. Uh, I want to thank you for staying uh, a few minutes over time, uh, late in the day. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer here. I'm also happy to answer a uh, little later as I remain in this uh, hall. Thank you. <laughs>